What is going on, everyone? James Hancock here. I'm here to review episode seven of season one of American Gods, an episode called A Prayer for Mad Sweeney. And I realize I'm a day late on this. I should have done it last night, but last night I was watching Twin Peaks. And then today I was traveling from Virginia to New York, so I didn't have time. But I just saw the episode. Absolutely loved it. I think it might be, maybe it's my favorite episode of the season. I mean, it was just it floored me. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to review an episode in real time. It took me way too long to get around to discovering the show, but now that I have, totally on board. Can't believe there's only one episode left, but at least I've got a nice big fat giant book that I can read in between now and the next season. Stars has given the green light to the next season. And according to somebody who left a comment on my previous video, Neil Gaiman claims that he's got enough material for five seasons of television, so... More please, bring it on. I'm more than happy to sacrifice a goat or pray before an altar or read some arcane tome, whatever bizarre ritual must be practiced to appease both the old gods and the new. I'm happy to do so if it means more American gods because this is a show that was made for me in a lot of ways because I grew up playing D&D. &D, I grew up being obsessed with mythology. I grew up really interested in myths and lore and fantasy books. And I love it when a movie or a show or a novel finds a way to bring ancient millennia old stories into the present day and make them relevant and make them work. I love the idea of old gods like Odin basically being at war with media and technology. It's just riveting to me. But this episode had a much more specific human focus and we get to, it basically, ignored the majority of the cast of characters to focus on two very specific characters who happen to also be, I think, my favorite characters in the show. So the episode begins with Mr. Ibis and Mr. Jekyll working on the body of a really, really unattractive human being. And to top it all off, we see his nice dead dingus just to really hammer home the fact that this guy is not necessarily going to win any uh, beauty contest. But this leads into telling a story about the past that has an incredible tie-in to our present day story. Because in the present day, Mad Sweeney and Laura are on this cool road trip together and they have natural antagonism, but also this brilliant natural chemistry that I find to be the most appealing part of the show. They just make perfect road trip companions in a lot of ways. But we also at the same time get a story where Emily Browning plays yet another character who came over from Ireland a long time ago. And we basically get her entire life story and her relationship with Mad Sweeney as well. I love it when movies and shows find a way to offer two sides of the same coin, no pun intended, since obviously we're talking about a leprechaun who has a lot of coins. But even more interesting is that Emily Browning plays these two parts and it's almost like part of her spirit has been carried over the centuries and is now in Lar. There's no direct connection, but it is interesting to see because obviously Emily Browning's a very versatile, flexible actress in a lot of ways. So the story takes place in America in 1721, obviously not America yet, but the colonies. And we learn about how a lot of people would come over from Europe and become indentured servants where they would pay for their passage in the room and board by working essentially as a slave for a long time. And then they were granted the freedom to try to carve out a life in the new world. But Essie McGowan is a girl who's grown up in Ireland who loves fairy tales, loves leprechauns, loves myths and legends, eats up all the stories in her native country and always basically, she always observes certain rituals about leaving offerings out for these fairies and leprechauns and mystical creatures. She is all in. But eventually her story takes a lot of sad turns because she ends up falling in love with a man that she is working with or working for. He gives her a necklace and she is accused of stealing that necklace. He throws her under the bus. She is sentenced to hang. But she ends up getting involved with the captain of a ship that is transporting her. She ends up in London. She ends up marrying that captain. She ends up resuming some of her thieving ways. She robs him blind and leaves offerings for the leprechaun. What's cool is that this opening part of the, of the show Usually with these flash with these flashback stories, they're like the first five or ten minutes, and then we just get back to the main narrative. But this was basically the bulk of the episode is this flashback. I do need to give a shout out to a viewer named Jim Reaper. He watched my previous video and he pointed out something really cool. He pointed out to me that Pablo Schreiber, who plays Mad Sweeney, the leprechaun, is actually Liev Schreiber's brother. Pablo Schreiber for me, his performance has been such a virtuoso, intense, incredible, incredibly dynamic performance. It's almost 
It almost steals the show away from the other actors. So back in the present day, we see that Mad Sweeney is communicating with the Ravens of Odin. They periodically check in on him and he kind of chastises them and talks a lot of smack. They release Salim from her, I guess like his oath to help them so that he can go look for his Jinn, the guy he's obsessed with. They're essentially star-crossed lovers, but one's a mythical being and they obviously, I can't remember which episode it was, episode four or five or three. Anyway, they had a really, really intense sexual encounter and he wants to go look for him. So now it's just Laura and Mad Sweeney continuing on this road trip. They steal an ice cream truck and then they're on their way. Meanwhile, back in the story of Essie McGowan, we see that in London, she continues to live the life of thievery. Slowly but surely, she forgets to leave offerings out for the leprechaun as she gets wrapped up in her lovers and her life of wealth, etc. But eventually she gets caught. Who does she end up next to in her cell but Mad Sweeney? He gives her some advice. She ends up sleeping with one of the guards. She gets her sentence commuted and gets sent pregnant over to the new world to live a life as an indentured servant. She soon puts on this act of innocence, seduces the man that she's working for, marries him, and she ends up living out a very, very full, rich life. We get a crazy bit back in the present where Mad Sweeney is explaining how he was once a king, he was once a warrior, and he fled from a battle when he felt as if he was going to be facing certain death. And he feels now he owes a battle in a big way. And so Odin is basically going to be the avenue through which he's able to repay that debt. But as he and Laura are driving along, she sees a bunny, flips the ice cream truck, she gets completely shredded in the accident, all of her dying skin pops open. Some of her organs pop out, including the gold coin that has been keeping her alive. Matt Sweeney finds a coin, sees her on the ground. We get this really creepy shot of her with these gray eyes. And yeah, I mean, everything about this show when it comes to violence and special effects has all been top notch. But then we get a crucial piece of information that the night that Laura died cheating on Shadow by giving Roadhead, we see that Matt Sweeney was there and we see that he was speaking to one of uh, Odin's ravens and he says, the job's been done. So obviously this was like essentially a hit placed out on Laura, perhaps as a, a means through which they could seduce Shadow over to their cause. But as Matt Sweeney's remembering this, he feels guilty and he puts the coin back into Laura. Laura wakes up, <laughs> pops him in the face, flips over the truck and she just starts giving him shit and they're back on their way. But what's great is that Matt Sweeney takes the punch and takes the verbal abuse, but he kind of smiles. And it's almost as if he's developed this affection for her because they have this great connection now. And even if she's not aware of the fact that he gave up what's most precious to him in order to bring her, bring her back, there is some incredible chemistry now between the two of them. It might be adversarial, but there's also a lot of love there as well. At least that's how I interpreted it. But then back in the story of Essie, we get what I think might be the most moving scene in the series to date. I was getting chills in my arms. I was getting even a little misty eyed, but we see that Essie in her old age and Matt Sweeney comes to see her. They're having this great conversation about their history and so on and so forth. And when it's time for her to die and move on, Matt Sweeney asks her to take his hand. I'm getting goosebumps even just talking about it and her body's found when it's still warm, kind of in mid-task. But I love the fact that this woman who was so caught up in the stories of fairies and leprechauns and so on and so forth, but it's now finds herself in a world where those stories are kind of inappropriate or no longer of relevance, that she and this mystical creature would find each other at the end of the story. So huge thumbs up on the episode. Dying to check out episode eight. I'm gonna be genuinely depressed when this show is over. But for all of you who recommended that I get on board the show, thank you so much again because it was a top-notch recommendation. I wouldn't say it's necessarily objectively the best show on TV right now, but for my personal taste, it just is a perfect home run and I'm just completely obsessed. Very eager to crack open the books. So hope you enjoyed this video. Please give me a shout on Twitter at Colbrex if you want to talk more or leave a comment in the comments below. And I'll be back at you soon with more videos, talking flicks, TV, etc. Onwards and upwards.